What's going on, guys? So I'm going to go ahead and get started because we got a, pretty much a full house already. What's going on, Vicky? Um, so I'm going to go and skip to chapter 11 and chapter 12. They're both relatively short, so it'll take up pretty much our whole 45 minutes to an hour that we usually do. Um, now, the reason why I skip to this chapter is because it gives you great psychology as to how the Trump family works. Um... This basically is going to cover when Fred Sr., who is Trump's father, dies and the whole will debacle. And I actually did preview this chapter. I didn't read it all the way, but I kind of skimmed through it just so I could kind of see what I was going to be dealing with tonight. And this... <laughs> I can't. We're going, we're going to go ahead and get started. This chapter, chapter 11, entitled The Only Currency. Fred Trump died on June 25th, 1999. The following day, his obituary was published in the New York Times under the banner Fred C. Trump, post-war master builder of housing for middle class, dies at 93. The obituary writer made a point of contrasting Fred's status as a self-made man with his flamboyant son, Donald. My grandfather's propensity for picking up unused nails at his construction sites to hand back to his carpenters the next day was noted before the details of his birth. Bitch, I can't, I can't, bitch, okay. The Times also repeated the family line that Donald had built his own business with minimal help from my grandfather. A small amount of money. A statement that the paper itself will refute 20 years later. Now, here's the thing that I'm kind of like, when I read that statement, I'm like, all right, girl. Yeah, they said that 20 years ago back in 99. But the people that worked at the New York Times in 99 and the people that worked in the New York Times in 2015, 2016... Probably is not the same people. Anybody who knows how media works, especially now, these people go in and out like cycles, bitch. That was almost 20 years ago. So they probably was all up Donald's ass at that point. We sat in the library, each with our own copy of the Times. Robert, Donald's youngest brother, was raped over the coals by his siblings for having told the Times that my grandfather's estate was worth between 250 and 300 million. Never, never give the numbers, Marianne lectured him. Marianne is the, uh, is, is the sister who is the judge, okay? As if he were a stupid kid. He stood there shamefaced, cracking his knuckles and bouncing on the balls of his feet just as my grandfather used to do, as if suddenly imagining the ensuing tax bill. The valuation was absurdly low. Eventually, we would learn that the empire was probably worth four times that, but Marianne and Donald would never have admitted that it was even that much. Later, we stood upstairs in the Madison room at the Frank E. Campbell Funeral Chapel on Manhattan's Upper East Side the most exclusive and expensive bereavement services provided in the city, smiling and shaking hands as a seemingly endless line of visitors passed through. Overall, more than 800 people moved through the rooms. Some were there to pay their respects, including rival real estate developers such as Sam LaFrat, New York Governor George Pataki, former Senator Al Diamato, and comedian and future Celebrity Apprentice contestant, Joan Rivers. Bitch, Joan Rivers was at the funeral, bitch. You know I love Joan. Okay. The rest were most likely there to catch a glimpse of Donald. On the day of the funeral, Marble Collegiate Church was filled to capacity. During the service, from beginning to end, everyone had a role to play. It was all extremely well choreographed. Elizabeth read my grandfather's favorite poem, and the rest of the siblings gave eulogies, as did my brother, who spoke on behalf of my dad, and my cousin David, who represented the grandchildren. Mostly they told stories about my grandfather, although my brother was the only one who came close to humanizing him. For the most part, in ways both oblique and direct, the emphasis was on my grandfather's material success, his killer instinct, and his talent for saving a buck. Donald was the only one to deviate from the script. In a cringe-inducing turn, his eulogy devolved into a pain to his own greatness. 
It was so embarrassing that Marianne later told her son not to allow any of her siblings to speak at her funeral. Of course he gonna make it about himself at his own father's funeral, bitch. What else? You, he give it to you every ball. He bring it to you every time. I don't know why she was surprised. Rudolph Giuliani, New York City's mayor at the time, also spoke. When the service was over, the six oldest grandchildren accompanied the casket to the hearse as honorary pale bearers, pallbearers, which meant, as was often the case in our family, that others did the heavy lifting while we got the credit. All of the streets from 5th Avenue and 45th Street to the Midtown Tunnel, more than 16 blocks away, had been closed to cars and pedestrians, so our motorcade with the police escort slid is easily out of the city. Now, I don't know if you know New York City, bitch, but to close down 5th Avenue, all of the streets between 5th Avenue and 45th Street to the Midtown Tunnel, bitch... His, his his father was important, bitch. You're doing a lot for a funeral, bitch. Okay? It was a quick trip to the All Faith Cemetery in Middle Village, Queens for the burial. We drove back to the city just as quickly, but with less fanfare, for lunch at Donald's apartment. Afterward, I accompanied my grandmother back to the house. The two of us sat in the library and chatted for a while. She seemed tired but relieved. It had been a very long day. A very long few years, actually. Other than the living maid who was asleep upstairs, it was just the two of us. I was supposed to be on my honeymoon. I stayed with her until she was ready to go to bed. When she said she was ready for bed, I asked her if she wanted me to stay or if there was anything I could get for her before I left. No, dear, I'm fine. I bent over to kiss her cheek. She smelled like vanilla. You are my favorite person, I told her. It wasn't true, but I said it because I loved her. I said it, too, because nobody else had bothered to stay with her after her husband of 63 years had been put in the ground. Bitch, if this ain't Knives Out, the live version, bitch, I just can't. Okay. Good, she replied. I should be. And then I left her alone in that large, quiet, empty house. Two weeks after my grand... This now, bitch, this is where the shit... It's the Carruthers, bitch, okay? <laughs> Two weeks after my grandfather's funeral, I was home when a DHL truck pulled up and delivered a yellow envelope containing a copy of my grandfather's will. I read through it twice to be sure I hadn't misunderstood anything. I had promised my brother I'd call him as soon as I knew anything, but I was reluctant to do so. Fritz and Lisa's third child, William, had been born hours after my grandfather's funeral. 24 hours after that, he begun having seizures. He had been in a neonatal intensive care unit ever since. They had two young children at home, and Fritz had to work. I had no idea how they were managing it all. I hated to be the bearer of more bad news, but he needed to know. Here we go, bitch. I called him. So what's the deal, he asked. Nothing, I told him. We got nothing. A few days later, I got a call from Rob. As far as I can remember, he had only ever called me before to let me know when Gam was in the hospital. He acted as if everything were fine. Now, this is Rob Donald's brother calling. If I signed off on the will, he implied, everything would be great. And he did need my signature in order for the will to be released for probate. Though it's true that my grandfather disinherited me and my brother, that is, instead of splitting what would have been my father's 20% share of his estate between me and my brother, he had divided it evenly among his four other children. We were included in a bequest made separately to all of the grandchildren, an amount that proved to be less than a tenth of 1% of what my aunts and uncles had inherited. In the context of the entire estate, it was a very small amount of money, and it must have been it must have infuriated Robert that it gave me and Fritz the power to hold up the distribution of assets. Okay, now here's the thing. Here's the thing. It always come down to the money. This is why you take care of everybody in the family. Leave no stone unturned, because this bitch been mad since the will. This bitch been mad since her father got dead dirty by the family. This is why you take care of people. Leave no stone unturned. 
Because they come back and they write books about your ass when it's all said and done. Now, they gagging. Okay? You should have you should have went ahead and just made it right. Y'all got all this money. And the, the crazy thing is, this is interesting to read. This is how rich people work. Because as a person like myself that's middle class or me and you, you know, we like, shit, if it's worth almost a billion dollars, go ahead and get that bitch. Three million, four million, fuck it, give it ten. You know what I'm saying? We ain't tripping off of that. But rich people, like we read in the chapter before, they never turn their money. Money is serious to them. So now y'all gagging, and she read this book. She wrote this book because y'all tried her father, for those of you that have been reading and following along. And then y'all disowned the kids. Y'all did her mother dirty as shit, okay? Now y'all gagging. This is why you take care of everybody sometimes. Just pay the bill, bitch. Pay the bill. Days pass, and I couldn't bring myself to sign. In the breath and concision of its cruelty, the will was a stunning document that very much resembled my parents' divorce agreement. For a while, Robert called me every day. Marianne and Donald had assigned him to be the point person. Donald didn't want to be bothered, and Marianne's husband, John, had been diagnosed with esophageal cancer, and his prognosis was not good. Cashing your chips, honey bunch. Rob said repeatedly as if that would make me forget what was in the will. No matter how many times he said it, though, my brother and I had agreed not to sign anything until we had some idea of what our options were. Eventually, Rob began to lose patience. Fritz and I were holding everything up. The will couldn't go to probate until all of the beneficiaries had signed off. When I told Rob that Fritz and I weren't yet willing to take that step, he suggested we get together and discuss it. At our first meeting, when we asked Rob to explain why my grandfather had done what he had, Rob said, listen, your grandfather didn't give a shit about you. And not just you. He didn't give a shit about any of his grandchildren. Bitch! Bitch! I cannot! I am gaggy! I can not, Okay? I cannot. This family is ghetto, honey. This is, you know, this is this is the young and the restless bitch. This is like, like now, I mean, like, you know how when you used to write, watch, uh, well, maybe you didn't, you used to watch the stories like Young and the Restless, All My Children, Bold and the Beautiful and shit. And you'd be like, where the fuck do they be getting these storylines from? Like, who lives like this? Bitch, they was living like this. Oh, my God. We're being treated worse because our father died, I said. No, not at all. When we pointed out that our cousins would still benefit from what their parents were getting from my grandfather, Rob said any of them could be disowned at any time. Donnie was going to join the army or some bullshit like that. And Donald and Ivana told him if he did, they'd disown him in a second. Our father didn't have that luxury, I said. Rob sat back. I could see him trying to recalibrate. It's pretty simple, he said. As far as your grandfather was concerned, dead is dead. He only cared about his living children. I wanted to point out that my grandfather hadn't cared about Rob either, but Fritz intervened. Rob, he said, this just isn't fair. Okay? I lost track of how many meetings the three of us had been had between July and October 1999. There was a brief respite in September while I was in Hawaii for my postponed wedding and honeymoon. At the very beginning of our discussions, Fritz, Robert, and I agreed that we would leave Gam out of it. I assume she had no idea how we'd been treated in my grandfather's will and saw no reason to upset her. Hopefully, we would be able to resolve everything and she'd never have to know that there had been a problem at all. I spoke to her every day while I was away and once back in New York, resumed my visits to her. The negotiations, if they could even be called that, also resumed. There was a numbing sameness to our conversations. No matter what Fritz and I said, Rob came back with his cliches and canned responses. We remained at a standstill. I asked him about Midland Associates, the management company my grandfather had set up decades earlier in order to avoid paying certain taxes and benefit his children. We keep hearing about how they dodge taxes, and that's why 
he won't release his taxes. He learned this shit from his father. This shit is crazy. Midland owned a group of seven buildings, including Sunnyside Towers and the Highlander, that were refer referred to in my family as the Mini Empire. I knew very little about it. None of my trustees had ever explained what role it played or how money was generated, but I received a check every few months. We wanted to know how or if my grandfather's death would affect the partnership going forward. Now, I want to stop here, okay? I want to stop here real quick because... Be clear, I don't feel bad for Mary Trump because Mary Trump is not poor. She wasn't poor when this will was being discussed, okay? Be clear, these people still have money. To me and you, poor is broke, bitch. Oodles of noodles, tuna fish, sardines in a can, hot dogs and pork and beans, Kool-Aid, no sugar, peanut butter, no jelly. That is poor to me and you. These people are not poor. She's not, she's poor to rich people's standards, okay? But to me and you who have to work every day and figure it out on a month-to-month -month basis, this bitch is not poor, okay? So please, I, and this is why I, I, wanted, I said this, please, if you even thought about feeling bad for this bitch, because trust me, she's cashing in with this book. I didn't pay for it. I got the PDF, no shade. Okay, these people, this is rich people problem. She's rich people poor. And that's a difference, bitch. I'm just saying. I asked them about that. None of us knew the money that the roller played. We weren't asking for a specific dollar amount or percentage of the estate. Just some assurance that the assets we already had would be secure in the future. And if given the family's enormous wealth, there was anything they could see their way clear to doing as far as my grandfather's estate was concerned. As the executors and, along with Elizabeth's sole beneficiaries, Marianne, Donald, and Robert had a wide latitude in that area, but Rob remained noncommittal. At our final meeting in the bar of the Drake Hotel on 56th Street and Park Avenue, it was clear that Robert had begun to understand that we weren't going to back down. Prior to that, despite the unpleasant things he'd been saying to us, he had maintained an affable, hey kids, I'm just the messenger attitude. That day, he reminded us once again that my grandfather had hated our mother and had been afraid his money would fall into her hands. That was laughable because for more than 25 years, my mother had lived according to the terms the Trumps had set, following their decisions to the latter. She had lived in the same poorly maintained apartment in Jamaica, Queens. Her alimony and child support payments had rarely been increased, yet she had never asked for more. Finally, Fred had disowned us because he could. The people who'd been assigned to protect us, at least financially, were our trustees, Marianne, Donald, Robert, and Erwin Durbin. But they apparently had no interest in protecting us, especially at their own expense. Rob leaned forward suddenly serious. Listen, if you don't sign this will, if you think of suing us, we will bankrupt Midland Associates and you will be paying taxes or money you don't have for the rest of your lives. Bitch. If that wasn't a Victor Newman motherfucking comment, bitch. Bitch. That was some stories. Shit, bitch. Okay. <laughs> there was nothing left to say after that. Either Fritz and I gave in or we fought. Neither option was a good one. We consulted with Irwin, who felt like the only ally we had left. He was incensed about how poorly our grandfather had treated us in the well. When we, when we told him how Robert had responded when we asked about Midland Associates and our shared other Trump entities, he said, your share of the ground leases under Shore Haven and Beach Haven alone are priceless. If they're not going to do anything for you, you're going to have to see them. I had no idea what a ground lease was, let alone that I had a share in two of them. But I knew what priceless meant, and I trusted Erwin. Based on his recommendation, Fritz and I made a decision. After all those months, William was still in the hospital and Fritz and Lisa were feeling overwhelmed. I told him I'd take care of it and called Robert that afternoon. Is there anything you guys can do, Rob, I asked. 
Sign the will and we'll see. Really? Your father's dead, he said. I know he's dead, Rob, but we're not. I was so sick of having that conversation. He paused. Marianne, Donald, and I are simply following dad's wishes. Your grandfather didn't want you or Fritz, or especially your mother, to get anything. I took a deep breath. This is going nowhere, I said. Fritz and I are going to hire an attorney. As if a switch had flipped, Robert screamed, You do whatever the fuck you need to do, and slammed the phone, bitch. <laughs> ah! <laughs> bitch! Bitch! This is the young and the restless, bitch. I'm sorry. The next day, there was a message from Gam on my answering machine when I got home. Bitch, this is about to crack your face. This next package, bitch, this next passage, bitch, is about to crack your face. Mary, it's your grandmother, she said tersely. She never referred to herself that way. It was always damn. I called her right back away. Your Uncle Robert tells me you and your brother are suing for 20% of your grandfather's estate. I felt blindsided and said nothing right away. Obviously, Rob had broken our agreement and told my grandmother his version of what we've been discussing. But the other thing that held me up was that my grandmother spoke as if I was getting what would have been my father's share of the estate was somehow wrong and unseemly. I was confused about loyalty, about love, about the limits of both. I thought I was part of the family. I got it all wrong. Gam, we haven't asked for anything. I don't know what Rob told you, but we're not suing anybody. You better not be. We're just trying to figure this all out, that's all. Do you know what your father was worth when he died, she said? A whole lot of nothing. Then there was a pause and then a click. She hung up on me. Bitch! When it comes to money, rich people don't give a shit. Now, mind you, according to Mary, this is her... Recollection of a bitch. Yes, some Natasha, Barbara, this is Shirley. Bitch, that was a Barbara, this is Shirley moment, bitch. Mind you, according to Mary's book, Mary the one, the bitch got almost got, you know, wild out shopping with a Rolls Royce. Somebody robbed the ass, broke a pelvis and shit. Mary there in the hospital with her and shit. Waiting to exhale, talking about Donald, helping her with her no shit husband. But when it come down to the money, honey, they don't give a fuck about none of that, bitch. You coming after my coins, bitch. <laughs> That's basically what grandma said, bitch. You're coming after my coins. Sit your little dumb ass down. And I don't want to hear that shit. Okay? I'm gagging. Okay? Gagging. I sat there with the phone in my hand, not knowing what to do next. It was one of those moments that changes everything, both what came before and what will come after, and it was too big to process. I called my brother, and as soon as I heard his voice, I burst into tears. He called Gam to see if he could explain what we were really asking for, but they had basically the same conversation. Her parting shot to him was slightly different, though. When your father died, he didn't have two nickels to rub together. I can't, bitch. This old lady is a key, bitch. In the world of my family, that was the only thing that mattered. If your only currency is money, that's the only lens through which you determine worth. Somebody who has accomplished in that context as little as my father was worth nothing. Even if he happened to be your son. Further, if my father died penniless, his children weren't entitled to anything. My grandmother, grandfather had every right to change his will as he saw fit. My aunts and uncles had every right to follow his instructions to the letter, despite the fact that none of them deserved their share of Fred's fortune any more than my father did. If not for an accident of birth, none of them would have been a multimillionaire. Prosecutors and federal judges don't typically have $20 million, $20 million cottages in Palm Beach. Executive assistants don't have weekend homes in South Hampton. Although, to be fair, Marianne and Elizabeth were the only two of the siblings, other than my father, to work outside of the family business. Still, 
They're acting as if they earned every penny of my grandfather's wealth and that money was so tied up in their sense of self-worth that letting any of it go was not an option. On Erwin's advice, we approached Jack Bernoski, a partner at Farrell Fritz, the largest law firm in Nassau County. Jack, a pompous, self-satisfied man, agreed to take us on as clients. His strategy was to prove that my grandfather's 1990 will should be overturned. Fred Trump had not been of sound mind and at the time the will was signed, and he had been under the undue influence of his children. Less than a week after we served the executors, Jack received a letter from Lou Lorino, a short, wiry pit bull of a lawyer who was representing my grandfather's estate. The medical insurance that had been provided to us by Trump management since we were born had been revoked. Everyone, see, playing with your health care, bitch. Sound familiar? Sound familiar, bitch, playing with your health care. The first thing they did when that will got contested was they took away the health insurance, bitch. He, do, he did the same shit with Obamacare, but thankfully the courts was like, bitch, you're trying to, the same habits, okay? Everyone in my fam in the Trump family was covered by it. My brother depended upon this assurance to pay for my nephew's crushing medical expenses. When William had first fallen ill, Robert had promised Fritz that they would take care of everything. He should just send the bills to the office. Taking away our insurance, which had been Mary Ann's idea. This is the judge, bitch. The judge. Didn't benefit them at all. It was, a, was merely a way to cause us more pain and make us more desperate. William was out of the hospital by then, but he was still susceptible to seizures, which was which more than once had put him in a state of cardiac arrest so severe that he would have not survived without CPR. He still required the round-the-clock nursing care. The family all knew this, but none of them objected, not even my grandmother, who was aware as anybody that her own desperately ill great-grandchild would probably need expensive medical care for the rest of his life. Fritz and I had no idea but to launch another lawsuit to make them reinstate William's medical insurance. The suit required depositions and affidavits from the doctors and nurses responsible for William's care. It was time-consuming and stressful and culminated in, a, in an appearance in front of a judge. Lorino defended the cancellation of the insurance by first claiming that we had no right to expect the insurance in perpetuity. It was rather a gift that had been bestowed upon us out of the goodness of my grandfather's heart. He also downplayed William's condition, insisting that the round-the-clock nurses who attended to William had saved his life more than once were overpriced babysitters. If Fritz and Lisa were worried that their infant son might have another seizure, he said, they should just learn CPR. The depositions did nothing to help us. I couldn't believe what a terrible interlock, lock, interlocator Jack was, I'm sorry. He failed to follow up and went off on tangents. Despite the fact that Fritz and I had prepared long lists of questions for him, he rarely, if ever, referred to them. Robert, much more detached than the last time I'd spoken to him, reiterated my grandfather's hatred of my mother as his central justification for the disinheritance. Marianne angrily referred to me and my brothers as absentee grandchildren. I thought all the time she had called the house when I was visiting my grandmother. Now I understood why she never told my grandmother to say hi. My grandfather, she said, had been furious with us because we had never spent time with our grandmother, completely ignorant to the history of the last decade. Apparently, my grandfather had also hated that Fritz never wore a tie, and I, as a teenager, had dressed in baggy sweaters and jeans. When he was deposed, Donald didn't know or couldn't remember anything. A kind of strategic forgetfulness he has employed many times to evade blame or scrutiny. All three of them claim in their sworn depositions that my grandfather had been sharp as a tack until just before he died. During that time, my Aunt Elizabeth ran into a family friend who later relayed the exchange to my brother. Can you believe what Fritz and Mary are doing? She asked them. All they care about is money. Of course, wills are about money. But in a family that only has one currency, wills are also about love. I thought Liz might have understood that. She had no power. Her opinion about the situation wouldn't have mattered to anybody but me and my brother. 
but it still hurt that she was towing the party line. Even a silent, powerless ally would have been better than none at all. After almost two years, with legal bills piling up and having made no progress on any kind of settlement, we had to decide whether to take our family to court. William's condition remained serious, and a trial would have taken the kind of energy and focus my brother didn't have. Reluctantly, we decided to settle. Damn, bitch. All of that. Murray and Donald and Robert refused to settle unless we agreed to let them buy our shares of the assets we'd inherited from our father. His 20% of the mini empire and the priceless ground leases. My aunts and uncles submitted a property valuation to Jack Bernoski and using their figures, he and Lou Lorena arrived at a settlement figure that was likely based on suspect numbers. Jack told us that, short of a trial, it was the best we could expect. We know they're lying, he said. But as he said, she said. Besides, your grandfather's estate is only worth around $30 million. That was only a tenth of the estimate Robert had given the New York Times in 99, which itself would, only, would turn out to be only 25% of the estate's actual value. Fred no doubt believed that my dad had been given the same tools, the same advantages, and the same opportunities as Donald had. If Freddie had thrown them all away, that wasn't his father's fault. If, despite them, my dad had continued to be a terrible provider, my brother and I shouldn't consider ourselves lucky, should consider ourselves lucky that there were trust funds our father couldn't squander when he was alive. Whatever happened to us after that had nothing to do with Fred Trump. He had done his part. We had no right to expect more. While the lawsuits were still in progress, I received word that after a brief illness, Gam had died on August 7th, 2000 at Long Island Jewish Medical Center, just as my grandfather had. She was 88. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. God don't like ugly. And I don't know who you believe in, but... Karma has a way, and I'm not saying, I mean, the lady was already old, but you get on the phone with your granddaughter after the will gets contested to tell her not to ask for no money, basically being nasty. And a little over a year later, you kick the bucket. That's the gag. Okay? Karma is a bitch. So she done kicked the bucket. Not a year later, after her husband died, after she got on the phone being nasty to that girl. If I'd have known she was sick, I think I would have tried to see her. But the fact that she hadn't asked to see me clarified just how easy it had been for us to let each other go. We had never spoken after that last phone conversation. Just how, just as I had never spoken to Robert, Donald, Marianne, or Elizabeth. I, it had never occurred to me to try. Fritz and I decided to attend Gam's funeral, but knowing we were unwelcome, we stood in one of the overflow rooms at the back of the Marble Collegiate Church. Along with a couple of Donald's security guards, we watched the service on a closed-circuit monitor. The eulogies were remarkably only for what was not said. There was a lot of speculation about my grandparents' reunion in heaven, but my father, their oldest son, who had been dead for almost 27 years, was not mentioned at all. He didn't even appear in my grandmother's obituary. I received a copy of Gam's will a few weeks after she died. It was a carbon copy of my grandfather's, with one exception. My brother and I had been removed from the sec section outlining the bequest for her grandchildren. My father and his entire line had now been effectively erased. <sighs> the shade. The shade, bitch. Now, first off, money isn't everything. But what I'm finding as, as I go along in life is that only poor people say that. 
You don't hear rich people saying money isn't everything. And I feel like we got to get out of that habit of thinking that way. At least I'm going to get out of that habit of thinking that way. Because that's crazy. Now, to be fair, if you can even be fair in this situation, this is all, man, this is one person's account. Okay? This is her account. But I believe her. And I, I had to sit and read the book and think to myself, do I believe her because I just can't deal with Donald Trump or Donald Trump is so disgusting to me? Am I wanting to believe her just because of that? But then when I read certain certain sections, I'm like, this bitch is spilling the tea. And it goes to show you that you can be nice to a person. You can do everything right for a person. But if they don't fuck with you, they don't fuck with you. And there's really nothing that you can do about that. No matter how nice you are, no matter how you try to flip the situation and be cool and keep it cute, if they don't fuck with you, they don't fuck with you. Like, how you erase your own child from the obituary? How you erase your brother from the obituary? And that gives you context as, like, Marianne is a judge. Donald Trump is our president. These are the people running the country. People that do their own families dirty. That's crazy. Like, you left your own brother out of the obituary. And part of me was like, oh damn, that's fucked up. They changed that old lady well. But reading me this lad, these last two chapters, the kids ain't changed that well. The grandmother changed that well. She changed that well. Like, that's crazy to me. She changed that well. But I tell you, this is this is a hell of a read. We gotta get out here. We gotta vote. I know it sounds cliche. I know the shit sounds like a cliche, y'all. But we gotta vote. We gotta vote. We gotta make sure. We get out here and get this man out. We really can't afford another term like this. As a country, for our sanity, from a social standpoint, from our, sta from our positioning on a global world stage, we cannot afford another four years of this. We, we j it's not even about, oh, I just won't be able to deal with it. It's like, no, like, for real, like, we, we, we really can't afford it. Like, look at the way that the coronavirus is being handled. Look at the way shit is going down. Like, our passport power, the ranking of our passport is going down. We not even allowed to enter certain countries, even our, our allies' countries, because we can't even get a handle. We don't know how to stay in a fucking house and wear a goddamn mask. And we don't have the leadership from the top to get shit done. And a lot of the leadership on the mid-level, the governors and shit, they playing to the person at the top. And if anything that this book should tell you, if he can't be loyal to his blood, what make you think he gonna be loyal to his party? That's just crazy to me. Like, make sure you get out there and vote. Wait in line. Don't go home because they're going to try it. I'm telling you now, voter suppression is real and they're going to try it, especially this time. He's desperate. They're going to try it. There's not going to be a case, especially in those southern states where you go to the poll and it ain't no bullshit. Make sure you bring your ID. If you got an ID that got the, the, the address where you used to live at, Get that motherfucker changed to the address where you are currently residing so it ain't no problems. Make sure that everything is registered with the MVA, DMV or whatever, Department of Motor Vehicle, whatever, 
so that your ballot, your, your provisional ballot, and your preview ballot, everything is sent to the right address. Make sure everything matches so that when you go to that voting booth, it ain't no goddamn problems. They ain't got to give you a, 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 a late ballot or whatever because your address don't match or whatever bullshit they try to come up with. Make sure you do everything that you need to do. On that note, I'm about to go watch Doom Patrol and the show. I'm going to try this Charlize Theron movie again because if you're saying I'm going to watch it, I ain't watching. If you're not following me on social media, at Dapper Dan Midas on Twitter and Instagram. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you hit the bell at the top for notifications. Venmo Cash App at Dapper Dan Midas. You guys have a great evening. We will reconvene on Tuesday. I think I'm going to read one more chapter out of this and then we're going to call it a day. Um, Y'all be blessed. Have a good night and be safe.